Hello everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. First we're going to follow up with some of the questions from last lecture. So here we have these three examples. We have three bromobenzaldehyde, we have four tert-butylphenol, and one ethoxy, two trifluoromethylbenzene. Now if you recall, if we have something in the one and the three position, we call that meta. If we have something in the one and the four position, we call that para. And if we have something in the one and the two position, we call that ortho. Uh, additionally, I had assigned three problems for naming molecules. Here we have three bromo, four methyl, cyclohex, one ene. The reason that uh, the alkene is uh, numbered one is because it's given the main priority over any functional groups. And so then we count one, two, three, which is why the bromine is in the three position, four methyl. And we also list our substituents in alphabetical order, which is why the bromine comes before the methyl group. Here we have this funky looking molecule. We find the longest carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you try any of the other ones, such as this, one, two, three, four, five, six, you can see that that's less than eight. We try one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's still less than eight. So we know that the longest linear chain is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now we have to choose whether we're going to pick the bromine or the chlorine as our priority. In this case, because bromine is a larger element, it's given the priority. Uh, it's also alphabetical, so this is why it's listed first. So we have one bromo, eight chloro. Here we have one, two, three, four. This is the four position. Five, this is the five position. 4,5-diethyl octane. In this example here, we have what's called a diene, which is where we have two alkenes in the same molecule. Now this alkene here is symmetrical, and so it isn't given an E or a Z nomenclature because if you were to switch these substituents, it wouldn't change from being E to Z because it would be the same molecule. Now when it comes to this alkene, because the bromine uh, is the priority substituent on this carbon of the olefin, and there's only one carbon on the other side of the uh, olefin. They're opposite from each other, which is entgegen, and so they're given the E uh, nomenclature for this alkene. And then in terms of numbering, um, we find the longest linear chain as usual, one, two, three, four, five, six. So in the two position is the bromine, one, two, uh, two, three is where the second alkene is, but because it starts at the two position, uh, two is where one of the alkenes comes in the nomenclature. Three, four, five, the four, five alkene starts in the four position, so the four comes from that. And um, that's essentially the basis of our molecule. Now, one of the methyl groups is given the methyl nomenclature, um, but the other methyl is included in the backbone, which is part of the hexane backbone. So I wanted to introduce a couple additional functional groups before we continue with the chirality lecture for today. So one functional group of interest is carbonates. It's kind of like an ester, but there's an oxygen on either side. Sodium carbonate would be an example of an inorganic compound, but if we, instead of having a sodium or another metal on the oxygens, we have some carbon, then it would be an organic carbonate. Here, if we have two double bonds directly in a row, like carbon, double bond, carbon, double bond, carbon, we call that an allene. These tend to be very reactive intermediates. Um, some exist in the case of MAP gas, which is used as a welding gas, for instance. If we, instead of having carbons like that, we had a nitrogen carbon oxygen, this would be called an isocyanate. Similarly, if we were to replace the oxygen with a sulfur, that would be an isothiocyanate. Another similar one is a ketene. Ketenes are kind of like allenes in the case that they're very sensitive and unstable, but they often exist as intermediates for some synthetic transformations. Another commonly encountered one, which is isoelectronic, is the carbodiimide. These are used as coupling reagents in organic synthesis, which is a topic we'll cover at a later date. Now, if we have two other compounds here, cyanates and thiocyanates, which are a bit like isocyanates and isothiocyanates, except the way that they're connected has been reversed. So instead of being connected through the nitrogen, we're connecting through the oxygen. And in the case of the thiocyanate, we're connecting through the sulfur, respectively. So let's get to chirality. So just like you have a left hand and a right hand, they're mirror images of each other, but they're not superimposable. If you try and line up all of your fingers with each other, you'll find that your thumb stick out on either side. And there's no way that you can put one hand over the other and have them look exactly the same and have all of your fingers the same length. And so molecules can be handed. Here I show 
um, R bromochlorofluoroiodomethane and S bromochlorofluoroiodomethane. And the difference is there's a mirror plane in between the two. So if you were to line up the chlorine and the bromine on both of these by like lining up these molecules over top of each other, the fluorine would overlap with this red iodide and the red fluorine would overlap with the blue uh, iodide. And so you can tell that they're distinct molecules because you can't superimpose them on each other. The R nomenclature is rectus, which means that it's a right-handed molecule, and the S nomenclature is sinister, which means that it's a left-handed molecule. Um, if you're wondering about this, it was because uh, left-handed people were thought to be evil. There's something wrong with them, which is where sinister gets its like negative connotation from. Okay. So here we have uh, the method that we go through the naming process. So generally, uh, you assign priority to each of the four connections to a carbon center, uh, starting with the lowest priority, stick that into the plane of the page, and then you go from highest to lowest priority respectively afterwards. So here we can see our bromofluoroiodomethane. The lowest numbered element here is fluorine. If we look at the periodic table, fluorine is the smallest, then chlorine, then bromine, then iodine. So the fluorine goes into the page. We can kind of ignore it for now, now that we've stuck it in there. When you're manipulating the way that you draw this, you have to make sure that the relative orientation of each of these substituents is the same. And if you're struggling to do this correctly, it would be helpful to use a molecular modeling kit. Um, I highly recommend modeling kits for anyone who's doing organic synthesis, even if you don't think that you need it. It's very handy to have for complicated examples, and especially early on, like right now. So the fluorine's in the plane of the page. As I identified previously, uh, iodide is the largest, bromine is the next largest, chlorine is the smallest, and so because of this, we go clockwise between this, therefore it's rectus. Clockwise equals rectus. Now we'll look at another example. So if we have two oxygens, for instance, you might wonder, well, which one do we give priority to? So what we do is we give the longest chain afterwards um, priority because there's more carbons. Um, and so here you can see we have a methyl, we have an ethyl acetal. Um, however, the bromine is still the largest, so the bromine gets the main priority. But because the ethyl is larger than the methyl, we go clockwise once again. This molecule is also rectus. Now, here's another example. We have an amine group, an ether group, a tert butyl group, and a hydrogen. The hydrogen goes into the plane of the page. Nitrogen is the largest element. But then because tert butyl has more carbons directly connected than the ethyl does, the tert butyl gets priority. And we have a sinister molecule in this example. Now let's look at a little bit more complicated of an example. So for something like this, you might immediately be overwhelmed and think, how am I ever going to solve something like this? It's too complicated. I'm just going to give up. I'm going to guess. It's 50-50, but that's not wise. So first what we're going to do is we're going to simplify it. We're going to replace this big bulky group with an R group, and we're going to replace that small but still confusing group with an R prime group. Because for stereocenters, most of the time you don't need to make dis distinctions unless they become very, very complicated. So now we're going to number this pyrrolidine ring. So we start with the nitrogen, one, two, three, four, five. We go this way because this is where the first substituent is. If we were to go the other way, it would be a three, four, five, and three and five are more than two and four. So we see that there's two stereocenters. There's one here and there's one here. So let's start by looking at two. We're going to simplify it a little bit. We're going to stick the hydrogen in the plane of the ring. Then we're going to ignore the, the ring connection and we're just going to simplify it. And so we realize nitrogen is still the largest element here. Then we have carbon. We have one carbon here and one carbon here. However, the ester group is connected to two oxygens while this carbon chain over here is just connected to hydrogens. So we give priority to the the ester group here. So we go one, two, three. This ends up being counterclockwise, which is sinister. Now let's look at stereocenter four. So stereocenter four, here I've flipped it around so that we can stick the hydrogen in the plane of the ring. So we've flipped it around. Here we can see that oxygen is larger than carbon. Um, carbon is element six, oxygen is element eight. So oxygen gets the priority. Then between this carbon chain to the nitrogen, and then this carbon chain, which leads to more carbons, we can see that nitrogen is a larger element than carbon, and so the nitrogen portion gets priority. So we go one, two, three, and in this case, it goes clockwise, which is rectus. Okay. 
So this is overall this name here, but this is how we would put the nomenclature for the 2s and the 4r when we're naming something like this. So now we're going to look at cyclohexanes specifically uh, for a little bit. So when we usually draw molecules, we draw them flat like this. But in the case of a cyclohexane, they actually look more like this. And this is called the chair conformer of cyclohexane. And here I've drawn a little stick figure out of uh, organic structures for our buddy Stan sitting on his chair. So this is why it's a chair. You can see Stan sitting on it. Now, there's another conformation called a boat conformer, which is where one of these uh, CH2 groups just pops up. But these are disfavored because the hydrogens on these two CH2 groups are repelling each other. And so this is a higher energy intermediate, and most of the time in solution, you're going to have the chair conformations dominating. Um, you could imagine if you had a bunch of connecting groups that forced a cyclohexane to stay in a boat conformer, that it would be stuck and it couldn't invert. Um, but for simple cases, you can invert between them. So when we have substituents sticking off of a cyclohexane, they can be cis or trans to one another. We're not talking about whether they're in a boat or chair conformation for these examples at this point, because we're just drawing them in their simplified form. So here you can see these two chlorides are together. They're cis, and in this case, they're trans. These can also have uh, mirror images. Uh, so here you could imagine uh, that this could have an enantiomer uh, where the chlorine was down and then up. And if you build those with a model kit, you'll see that those aren't superimposable. Now, in the case of this one, they actually would be, if you were to take a mirror image of this, they would be the same molecule. And so when you have two molecules that are the same, just drawn differently, we call those meso compounds. M-E-S-O, meso. Okay, so if you have substituents in the 1-3 position, if you draw them in the flat way, this would still be cis. If you draw them like this, it would be trans. 1-4 would be cis like this, and it would be trans like this. Um, and you can have substituents that are axial or equatorial. Axial substituents are sterically disfavored because they pop up against each other and hydrogens are typically smaller, so hydrogens would prefer to be the ones in the axial position over something larger like a chlorine. And so we have these in equilibrium uh, usually. So this is 1,3-cis uh, dichlorocyclohexane. And you can see with these equilibrium arrows that this is not present very much of the time, but most of the time it's in the equatorial form. So these are axial because they're sticking up. These are equatorial because they're sticking to the sides. So for next lecture, um, it would be good for you to do a couple practice problems assigning stereocenters. Here's one of the enantiomers of serine, and here's uridine uh, in its natural form. And so you want to go through and assign priority for each of these stereocenters. Uh, and that should give you a decent amount of practice for this topic. So hopefully this has been really helpful for you guys today. If you have any questions, I'd encourage you to leave them in the comments. Um, if you have any criticisms or comments about how this lecture series could be done better, I'd be happy to hear it. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.